for its sin. Uh, Mark and Francis are passionate about food and wine. And what's unique about them is that they leverage Web 2.0 technology to, uh, again, create a tribe of people that are likewise passionate about those. And they have this incredible uh, series of podcasts where they interview people both about the business of food and also the enjoyment of food. And I would definitely urge you to look up the Restaurant Guys and their podcast series. And one of the things that they're doing as far as uh, supporting the community is that they're helping to spread the word about how restaurants can uh, be important to the local community in lots of different ways. So I'll turn it over to them. They'll tell you how that's working, and let's give them a big round of applause. I knew we were going to follow somebody really smart at FedEx. <laughs> I, I did, somebody smarter than we were. I didn't know it was going to be a parrot. We're following the bird. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Francis Schott, and this is Mark Pascal, and we own, as you just heard, Catherine Lombardi and Stage Left Restaurant in New Brunswick, New Jersey, which is a wonderful revitalized city that we've been involved in for like 30 years, just about 20 minutes north of here. Um, we opened Stage Left Restaurant in 1992 uh, because we were 26 years old and we didn't know any better. Um, and uh, uh, shortly after we opened, we got two stars from the New York Times. Within 18 months, we had gotten our third star from the New York Times, and it was off like a shot. Um, in, on May 22nd, Stage Left will be 18 years old. And we now do a lot of restaurant consulting, and people ask us all the time, and we do a lot of speaking as well, and people ask us all the time, what's the magic bullet in an industry that is so subject to failure? Um, you have three stars from the New York Times. You've gotten all sorts of awards from the Wine Spectator. You've taken your little 50-seat uh, restaurant and made it into a, a rather large restaurant with four private dining rooms and chandeliers and wine cellars and all kinds of great stuff, 26 food points from Zagat. 18 years later, how do you do it? And we've really isolated it down. And we do a lot of consulting. We usually charge for this, but we'll tell you this for free today because you're here at TED. Um, we've isolated the, the key to opening a restaurant in an industry that's prone to failure. You will recall that we opened in 1992. What you should do if you want to open a restaurant is open your restaurant at the dawn of the largest economic expansion in human history <laughs> and serve champagne and caviar and do it very, very well. And you should be fine. Uh, in 2005, in November of 05, almost 06, we opened Catherine Lombardi Restaurant. Catherine Lombardi is Mark's uh, maternal grandmother, and she was an excellent cook, and we, in a slightly more casual but still beautiful environment, recreate her, the spirit and, and substance of her food in Catherine Lombardi. Um, New Jersey Monthly Magazine said when we opened, the Breeders' Choice Poll said we were the best Italian restaurant in central Jersey. I agree wholeheartedly with New Jersey Monthly in that one regard, at least. Uh, and people have asked, you know, Francis and Mark, what have you learned from opening Catherine Lombardi, which we opened just right before 2006 began? And that is also simple. Uh, do not, under any circumstances, open your restaurant right before the largest economic contraction since the Great Depression. And there is the sum and substance of our business advice. But we didn't really come to talk to you about business. Um, we also have this radio program, which we've been on the air since 2005, and we have over 100,000 people who listen to the Restaurant Guys at restaurantguysradio.com. And you may wonder why 100,000 people from across the country, and indeed we get emails from across the world, listen to two guys from New Jersey talk about the restaurant business. And I have no idea. I wish I could help you, but I have no idea. But I think, I think it has something to do with the fact that what we talk about and what we're involved in is a love affair. Despite, uh, it, not with each other, despite rumors to the contrary, um, we are involved in a love affair um, with our restaurants, uh, with food, yes, and with the communities of which we have been able to hold a privileged position for 18 years and counting. And I use the word communities plurally because in independently owned, and this, we, are, we, are, we are fighting for our existence as more and more of life becomes not independently owned, independently owned, standalone restaurateurs today have a unique opportunity to stand at the center and be the locus and the intersection of a number of different communities. We have the communities of the, of the farmers who we now again know by name are farmers and we know where our food comes from and our fishermen. We stand at the center of the community of the people that work for us, and restaurants employ a large number of people, and the people that have worked for us over the last 17 years and still remain part of our family. We are at the center of a community of the people who stop in and are our regular customers. 
We're at the center of the community of the, people who, of, the, of the business people who use our business to help their business. And we are at the center of community, and this is really important, of all of the people who've come and gotten married in our restaurant or had bar mitzvahs in our restaurant or celebrated significant anniversaries in our restaurants or maybe even passed, uh, mourned the passing of a loved one at a lunch repast after a funeral in our restaurant. These are really important things. If there's one thing that Mark and I view as the most important part of what we do, it, it's not the food, although the food's super important and the wine's super important and being great is super important. We are publicans, and that's a great word. Publican comes from the public house, the keeper of the public house. That's what a pub is, sure, for the, the public house. Um, and we're losing our public spaces. We have fewer unstructured public spaces. Uh, we're less likely to be Elks or Rotarians or uh, members of the Moose Lodge or the Rosary Society or the Knights of Columbus or, in my family's case, the Friendly Sons of the Shillelagh would be the, the uh, <laughs> that's our, our uh, Valley Wick. Um, but we're losing our public places. And what's, what's um, disturbing, what's particularly disturbing is in lieu of public places, there are places arising that pretend to be public places. Uh, a classic example would be the mall. The mall, ladies and gentlemen, is not a public place. The commons is a public place. You can view it as being owned by everyone or being owned by no one, but it's a public place. The mall is owned by mall management, and what happens inside the mall is what mall man management will let happen inside the mall. Um, but I want to talk about more than just uh, the mall. I want to talk about a new and, in a way, uh, nefarious substitute and masquerader of a public place. I would like to talk to you about social networking sites. <laughs> Mark and I own social networking sites, like the kind that were around in 1685. We own social networking sites. Now, there are new kinds of social networking sites. I don't know if you've heard of them. They're on the internets. You know, through the tubes, you can, the internets, there they are. Um, but, and, and our type of social networking site has a different, uh, has a, a, some, some disadvantages to the new social networking sites on the internet through the tubes, right? Our social networking site, number one, you have to go there, okay? You have to actually come to my social networking site. Disadvantage, right? Uh, number two, you cannot come in your pajamas to my social networking site. Uh, number three, if you're a 54-year-old man who likes to pretend to be a 16-year-old cheerleader, <laughs> it's gonna be harder in my social networking site. There are some uh, there are some disadvantages to the other social networking sites as well. And here are some of the disadvantages. You don't have to watch someone cry, even if you make them cry. You don't get to be in the presence of someone laughing. And an image on a screen and an LOL does not cut it. It's not the same thing. In my social networking site, we are in the presence of a very powerful and basic human force and that is empathy. And it is, see, in person, we don't like to see someone cry. In person, we don't like to sit at a table with someone who is embarrassed, and we certainly don't do things to make them more embarrassed or ashamed. Uh, and in person, we don't like to make other people angry unless we're a sociopath, right? <laughs> Um, so we avoid these things, we observe rules of civility, and we build on, we find the commonality between us, and on that commonality, we build our community, right? That's uh, what it's all about. Screens and keyboards mitigate empathy. Sitting down and breaking bread and raising a glass increase empathy. And that is why the public house and the publican and going to a place and being in, present, in the presence of a person is very important. Social networking sites can quite easily become anti-social networking sites. Um, freedom of speech was never meant to include the freedom of the consequences of your speech. Words spoken in person cannot be unspoken. And because of that, they have weight and they have meaning and they have importance. And if we want our relationships and our communities to have weight and meaning and importance, we need to go out and be in each other's presence. I'm gonna tell you one story because I'm a bartender and we tell stories. Um, 
we had on our radio show maybe one of the most important guests I think we've ever had. She's not particularly famous, but she's a writer of note, and her name is Cara De Silva. And Cara De Silva published a very important book. It's perhaps the most important cookbook I've ever read, and all I do is I read books on food and wine. Um, and uh, the name of the book is In Memory's Kitchen. In Memory's Kitchen uh, was written by the women of the Theresienstadt concentration camp. Um, uh, Teretzin was a hoax camp set up in Czechoslovakia. It was set up by the Third Reich um, to prove to the world and to fool the world into thinking that they weren't the rat bastards that they actually were, or at least as bad a rat bastards as they actually were. And, um, and so in the Teretzin concentration camp, you know, this is the one where they very famously fooled the Danish Red Cross into saying, oh, that Hitler guy is not so bad. These, these, these camps are kind of nuts, right? Um, now, the reality in those camps was those prisoners were there against their will. They were, um, it was a transport camp. They, were, they were, could be sent to a death camp uh, at any minute and, and face sudden and certain death. And they were starving to death and they were worked to death. And it was just as evil as any other camp. But because it was a host camp, there was a little bit more wiggle room. And the women of the Theresienstadt did an amazing thing, a curious thing, with that wiggle room. They gathered scraps of paper and pieces of leather and anything they could, and they wrote, of all the crazy things, a cookbook. And um, there's a wonderful story about the book that, that Cara de Silva writes, in, uh, writes about in her book, In Memory's Kitchen, which you should definitely pick up. Um, you see, the, the Mina Poster was the main mover and shaker behind this cookbook, and there were a number of women who were involved. And Mina knew that she wasn't going to get out of Theresienstadt. And so she gave the book to a friend, and she extracted from her friend a promise that she would deliver this book to her daughter, Annie Stern, who had escaped to Palestine before the Nazi invasion. Mina had stayed behind and said to her daughter, um, she said, you know, she wasn't going to go because she didn't believe that anyone would hurt an old woman. And uh, it's kind of hard to believe still, but they did. So Mina extracts this promise, right? And so when Theresienstadt is liberated in 1945, the book goes to Czechoslovakia with a friend, where it stays for 10 years. 10 years later, the friend has a, a friend who is going to go to what is now Israel and gives them the information and says, you need to find this Annie Stern. I made a promise. You've got to deliver this book. Uh, by the time the person gets to Israel, uh, Annie Stern has just emigrated to New York. The book misses her. We don't know what happens to the book for the next 10 years. It is a mystery. About 12 years later, Someone walks into a meeting of Czechoslovakian Jews in New York City, and they say, does anyone know Ani Stern? And they give this description. This person, we don't know who this person was. It was a man. And someone says, you know, I think I may know this person. And so in a high rise in Manhattan, a telephone rings, and a woman picks up the phone, and a man says, is this Ani Stern? And the woman says, uh, yes. And uh, he says, I have a present from your mother, 25 years later. And so the book was brought to this woman, and, and Kara got her hands on it and heard this story and had to publish this book. And we had Kara on the show, and Mark and she and I talked for about an hour. And we kept coming back to the question of why. Why would starving women on the, on the, on the, on the brink of destruction, of all, starving to death, not having any food, why would they put themselves at risk and go to the trouble to write a cookbook? And Kara enlightened us that this is not the only book of its kind. There are about 20 books that have been written like this in history. At this, contemporaneously, there were some American POWs who were starving to death in the Philippines. And they also wrote a dream cookbook, a similar kind of a thing. And, you know, I think I've come up with uh, uh, um, an idea. I think it's because breaking bread is a fundament of our community. And I think it's why we humans came together in the first place. And I think it's the seminal act of human kindness to share your food with another. I think, furthermore, that the first step in, con in convincing one group of people to kill, that it's a good idea to kill another group of people, in order to do that, you need to first convince that first group of people that that second group of people is somehow less than human. You need to dehumanize them in their eyes. And I think it's very hard to kill someone once you've had dinner with them. Uh, and on a much smaller scale, in our free society, it's the public houses and the public places, in person and for real, uh, where we find the same forces at work. It's in that venue that we can come together, where we can physically break bread and be in each other's presence, in the presence of our basic human characteristic of empathy. And that's 
how we build community in each other's good company. And that's why local pubs and restaurants and bars and places where you come together are very, very important. Um, and this is an experience that cannot be emailed, it cannot be shipped abroad, and it cannot be shipped to your door. Thank heaven. Francis and I have been partners for a long time, so I know his half would be more than half. Uh, I as well started as a bartender. Uh, so rather than a lecture, I'm, I'm just going to tell a brief story uh, that, that I think that means a lot to me. It would be easier for me to do if there was three foot of wood between us, but I'll, I'll do my best anyway. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Grimm. No, not their real names. But they were indeed grim. Uh, they came into the restaurant one night. And to the best of our abilities, we did everything we could to make Mr. and Mrs. Grimm happy. We brought them everything they asked for. We showed them new things that they had never seen before. We encouraged them to have a great time. Mr. and Mrs. Grimm didn't have a great time. So off they went. And Francis and I sat back and said, well... You know, you win some, you lose some. Well, a few weeks later, Mr. and Mrs. Grimm came back. Same story. Worked and worked and worked, did everything we possibly could to get the Grimms to have a really, really good time. But again, the Grimms really, they really just didn't have a great time. But the Grimms kept coming back. And they came back more frequently. And more frequently. And more frequently. And the more they came in, the harder we worked to make sure that, those, that the Grimms had a really good time. And we began to think they were a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one day, Mr. Grimm reaches out his hand and he says, Thank you very much. We love you guys. You're great. This is our favorite restaurant. It's really, really wonderful here. Thanks so much. Mr. Grimm has never smiled. <laughs> <laughs> so, Francis and I kind of look at each other and, Okay, well, I guess we're doing it right. Great. So... Now they begun, begun, begin coming in once a week, and we see the Grimms once a week, and they're loosening up a little bit. They're smiling, they're laughing. They, they're, you know, they're not having a great time, but they're clearly smiling and laughing, and, and they're, they've caught on, and, and we work even harder to make sure that they have a good time. Uh, that was about eight years ago when that relationship started, and, uh, and about two years ago, um, Mr. Grimm came into the restaurant by himself. <clears throat> and what he said was, my wife had terminal cancer. We came here once a week. This was our three hours. This was our time to not have cancer. She would get dressed, put her wig on. I'd get dressed in my fancy clothes. We'd come here. And we'd forget about it all. We'd live our lives. And it's one of the most beautiful things that's happened in my restaurant. Um, so what Francis and I want to say to all of you today is in this world that pushes so hard against it, embrace the face-to-face. -face. Thank you and God bless.